Let's have a look at the political context of globalization in the way the world governs itself. The current solution of global governance is embodied in the United Nations organization. So it was founded after the Second World War in 1945 and it had a predecessor, the League of Nations, which was founded after the First World War and basically failed. It failed to fulfill its first purpose, which was to prevent world war again. It obviously failed during the Second World War. So the United Nations was founded then with the ambition to do it much better. And I want to read to you the preamble of the Charter of the United Nations to get a basic feeling of the great ambitions the founding uh, members had. So it says, we the people of the United Nations determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind. These guys, they were scared. Okay, so from that context on, they said, to reaffirm faith in the fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person and the equal rights of men and women and nations large and small and to establish conditions under which justice and respect for the obligations arising from treaties and other sources of international law can be maintained and to promote social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom and for these ends to practice tolerance and live together in peace with one another as good neighbors and to unite our strength to maintain international peace and security, to ensure the acceptance of principles of the institutions of methods that, uh, that armed force shall not be used safe in the common interest. So actually these first three, these three goals here aim at assuring global peace um, and only to use armed force when it is in the common interest. So that basically prevents one nation going against another nation and basically aims at preventing international war. Because if you only use armed force in the common interest, you know, it's not, it's not like people can go, uh, nations can go against each other. And to employ international machinery for the promotion of economic and social advancement of all people. So, so it's preventing war, that's for sure the, the biggest purpose of the United Nations, but also to promote economic and social development. So these are the goals, very noble goals, and it comes out from a real desperation. I mean, twice in their lifetime, they put this world on fire. And uh, so let's look at it. Let's look how the United Nations basically uh, works. This is uh, what it looks like, the United Nations system. That's the organigram. Don't worry if you get really confused by looking at that. <laughs> I was working for the United Nations Secretariat for over a decade and I still do not understand what that actually means. So let's take a more schematic view on, on the entire question of global governance. Well, if we want to create a global governance system, it has to do with building basically a state power and, and a state according to state theory, uh, consists of three different powers. The legislative, the judicial, and the executive. Uh, what are they all about? What does each one do again? Well, the legislative power creates the laws. It, in a democracy, it represents the people and enshrines into law what the people want. The executive power then takes the law and executes it. So it, it shouldn't have much of an own opinion and just really execute what the people want. And uh, it has a, a lot of execution power. So the police force and also the armed force, the military is part of the executive branch. The president, the head of the, of the government of the executive branch is usually also the commander in chief. So that has to do with really like we execute the law if it has to be even with force, right? And then we have the judicial power, which checks. One of its most important functions is that it checks that the executive power also really implements what the legislative power agreed on. And if somebody breaks the law and doesn't execute what the legislative power said, then the judicial power comes in and said, well, that's actually no work. So there's this checks and balances also between them. And, and that's how it works in a state. Now, globally, in the United Nations, what do you think? 
Do we have all three of them? Which one of the three do you think do we have and which one do we not have? Well, first of all, we surely do have a legislative power. That on the global level in the United Nations is represented in general by the General Assembly. So that's you can imagine it's more like the Congress, you know, the Senate, the House of Representatives. It's basically a representation of all the countries that come together and sit in the legislative chamber, in the General Assembly, and they write laws. They write a lot of agreements. One of the first set of laws that they wrote was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And they write lots of laws and they, everybody loves to participate in that, you know, the creation of something new. So that, that works quite well. Second, the judicial power. Do we have a judicial power? Do we have a, a global court where one nation can go to and sue another nation? Yes, there's the International Court of Justice in Den Haag. It was also founded together with the United Nations. And every member of the United Nations, so these more than 190 countries, are automatically member of this International Court of Justice. And the court has processed some more than 100, 130 cases over its lifetime. So some more famous, for example, the Milosevic case after the uh, wars in Yugoslavia and many other small cases as well. But there are some problems with this judicial power. One of the main problems is that it's, it's not set up well. The way it is constructed it doesn't, it doesn't really work. So because on the one hand in the United Nations they said well one of our founding principles is that nations large and small they are all equal. There is no nation which is superior to another one. And founding this having this as a founding principle also means that what happens then if one nation is right and one nation is wrong? Well, if none is superior of another one and two go against each other in a court case, then is one able to punish the other one or not? And it turns out that somehow historically they decided like, well, no, no, that's not possible. I mean, because nobody's superior. So the end of the story is that basically if the International Court of Justice says that one country is wrong, this country then actually has to agree to being punished. Because if it, if it says, well, I don't agree to then then actually nothing happens. And there have been lots of cases. For example, in the 80s, there was a very famous case of the United States and Nicaragua. And uh, the International Court of Justice really decided, yes, the United States broke international law. It basically aimed at and kicked out the Nicaraguan government. And this is breaking the law. And even the Reagan administration said, yes, it, it was our, our goal to intervene in this other country and kick out their government. So it was very clear that it was really international law was broken. And the United States says, yes, but we don't agree to be punished. And, and that was that. <laughs> a judicial system is usually not set up on the premise that the convicted party has to agree to be punished. So yes, we do have an international court uh, of justice, but does it really work well? It's not really set up. There are some really funny contradictions that are maybe arose historically and it's, it's, it's quite dysfunctional from that sense. But it does a lot of good work as well, as I said. There's some, some uh, important cases and it's the first time that we have something like that. You know, we also have to, we also have to be very aware uh, of these kind of things. I mean, only a hundred years ago, we, we were still, you know, we were, it was still the Wild West out there. At least we have something, we get slowly used to the idea, well, there is some kind of global structure, but it is all just very recent still. 60 years, that's not a long time historically, and in countries and societies and peoples, they just get used to it right now. So it's a first step, but it really doesn't really work like you would think it, it would. Now, finally, the executive power. Do we have a global executive power? Well, let me tell you a story so you understand that a little bit better. So after the Second World War, the world was really scared, right, as you saw. And, and they said, well, if we really want to prevent future generations from the scourge of war that twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to humankind, what we got to do is we have to, the most important thing what we got to do is we have to agree on a global armed force structure. So we need a global military, basically a global police. Because imagine if you would have a global military, 
that would be the end of international war. It's kind of like if then a, a conflict would come up, it would be more like imagine inside the United States. Well, if inside the United States, one state wanted to attack another state, uh, kind of like a civil war like conflict, but the, the feds would step in, the federal government would step in, the federal military would step in, that, that wouldn't go on long, right? They say, well, we have other ways to, to, to fix that. And, uh, and of course, if you have such a big centralized military power, these, you know, civil conflicts, they sometimes could become something like civil war, but actually if you have a real strong central power, international war, couldn't really happen anymore. And, and that's a very powerful idea because it basically what I just told you is that we have a solution to end international war by tomorrow. <laughs> Sounds like a hippie song, right? Let's end international war by tomorrow. But it really, there is a solution. There it is right there. Let's create a global military. And that would be that. So they said, okay, well, that's a genius idea. Let's do that. We don't, we really set the world on fire twice now. Let's go ahead with that. So basically what they said then is that, okay, but we have to be very careful because once we have this global military, who is in charge of what? Are you able, please don't discriminate me. I'm just a small country and, and I have strong feelings about that. So they started to discuss and discuss and discuss and imagine like almost 200 countries. They didn't get anywhere. So what they then decided is like, okay, wait. So, so they are, we don't get anywhere here, but there are five of us and these five have the atomic bomb right now at the end of World War II. And if we five don't agree, you know, this thing is going to blow up in our face. So, so why don't the five of us in the meantime go into the basement and we agree on some very basic principles. And during this discussion, each one of us has a veto right. Because like if one of us doesn't agree with atomic bombs, you know, it, it won't go well. So each of us really has to agree. Like we have to have a consensus there, not a compromise among the five of us, the atomic powers. And once we are done with that, we can come up again and then we can talk about with the other almost 200 countries, how, how are we going to go about that? Okay. So yeah. Okay. That's a good plan. So the five went into the basement and basically they're still sitting there. And that is nowadays called the security council. Uh, who are the five members? So the five members are the United States, the UK, France, Russia, and China. These are by now not the only countries that have the atomic bomb, but back then, these were the only countries who have the atomic bomb. The biggest problem that happened then is the Cold War started, and since they still had the veto right, um, they could never agree because there was Russia, China, the United States, and Europe, and the other. So it was always blood, it was completely paralyzed. Nothing really happened. No reform could happen. And it's, it's, it's still like that, and that, that's the closest what we have to a global executive power. So they have really power and they can say, well, military armed force should be used here or there in the common interest. Well, in the interest of these five countries who have a veto right, there's no African country, there's no South American country uh, in there, but they decide what is the common interest of the world. There have been many attempts to reform the Security Council. One of the biggest attempts happened uh, just in 2005, the, the then uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, Kofi Annan, proposed two plans to reform them. Plan One plan was to add new members to the Security Council, so to have an African and South American member and some other Asian members like India, for example, very, very big power. Uh, or the other way would be to completely do it more representative of the world and say, well, we just, we just structured by region. So Europe has one joint vo uh, voice, Africa has one joint voice, maybe even North America only have one voice and, and really structure it like this. And at the 60th anniversary of the United Nations in 2005, the idea was to approve this reform. It, uh, it, it failed horribly. I was at the United Nations at that time. It was really horrible to watch. M most countries really agreed and Kofi Annan did a great job in pushing it forward very far, but at the end, well, especially a lot of resistance from the Bush administration in the United States prevented to, to have a reform there. And, and here we are still. 
So as a result, it turns out that on paper we do have an executive force, but in reality, really, the fact that these five countries that are there because of some historical accidents, that they define what is the global common interest and then decide if the use of force is, that doesn't sit well with with the other countries and also these five countries. If you really ask them, they tell you, no, it's, it's really kind of funny. And that's why the United Nations until now does not have separate armed forces. There are these blue helmets, these peacekeeping missions, but their soldiers are still under national command. It's not like a Russian general can give an order to a United States soldier. No, they are still like under, they are still soldiers of, of their nation. So we do not have in the sense of separate global military. All right, so, so summing up global governance, what do we have? We have a global legislative power and that works very well. We write lots of international agreements on how we want to live together. Uh, then the executive power, uh, it does not, it, it, we, we, in principle, we should have, but we do not have really a global military. We do not have, we have five countries that can decide on the use of force, but then, so it's really, not really. And then we have a judicial power that is set up and, and there are judges and, and lawyers there. Uh, but then they say, OK, we, we clearly proved that you broke international law. But do you also agree with that you're going to be punished? Oh, you don't? Uh, all right. So, so to say it lightly, uh, it is a partial and incomplete global governance structure that we have in place. Um, and to say it more directly, no, it's not really functional. Uh, and the question if this structure that we have is is really able to do what it's supposed to do, which as a first goal is to prevent a third global conflict, that is still an open question. And actually being honest with you, even having worked in the United Nations, I have not met anybody who would say that this would be able to do that. Everybody agrees on that really very deep reforms are necessary to create a global, complete global governance structure that is able to do that. The first goal, which is to prevent a third global conflict. And then also the other goal to uh, assure socio-economical progress, human development for everybody around the globe. Now, that doesn't mean that the United Nations is not the best thing we ever came up with. It is surely the best solution we ever came up with uh, in the world with regards to global governance structure. At least now we have a table to go to. So as I said, a hundred years ago, we, we, it was still the Wild West. We didn't even know where to go to if, if, if we had a, a conflict. Now at least we have a table. Now the three legs this table is standing on are not really stable and it's a very shaky table. And if it really is able to help us to work things out on a table, as I said, very, very open question. Uh, but at least we have a table and that's already a lot of progress and we have to consider that. But, but now, theoretically, it's not the best possible table. And if we want to uh, prevent the Third World War and we want to achieve human development for everybody and to have human rights fulfilled, a lot of work is needed urgently and a lot of political will is needed very urgently. And only then we could aspire to have a global governance structure that goes along with globalization.